Hello, I'm Benjamin Miss, and this is Introduction to Psychology, Sensation and Perception. Let's take a brief moment and just remember why we're here. And I like to include this because this is some, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics data from 2015. Not much has changed in these regards. And some quick math shows us that compared to a high school diploma, over a 30 year degree, uh, career, an associate's degree will net an additional couple hundred grand, and a bachelor's degree will put another half a million on top of that. At today's prices, you know, that's a, that's a condo around this area, you know, that, that is a pretty big, pretty big difference in earning potential, uh, given the education. So we sometimes wonder, what are we doing? And we want to see, there's a lot of value here. Now, let's look at when we talk about sensation and perception, what we call illusions, because illusions help us to understand what's happening. This is from uh, Jimmy Hinton, and we're going to see a number of things happening here. So what I want you to do is to look at the center, the little cross in the center, and you're just going to stare at that. What should happen fairly quickly is you should notice that these dots that were pink are now disappearing and turning like a, a greenish color. The factors happening here are called Troxler fading, which is related to when you focus on something, things in your periphery tend to fade. They're not being regularly updated, and it's not like they're being held there. Uh, negative after effects and the phi effect, which is adding motion in the same way we do to still pictures when we watch movies. What this tells us is about how our visual system works and how we're constructing our reality. Here's another one, and this is called the visual mask illusion. And what you're looking at here is the, um, uh, they're gonna take a mask and they're gonna rotate it, right? And what you're gonna see is, okay, it looks like the front of the mask. So as it turns, you should see like you're looking through the mask, but what's happening? It's like the rotation has changed and you're still seeing the front of the mask. You know it's an illusion. You know you should be seeing the inside of the mask, but you keep seeing the pop-out effect. Visual clues are inconsistent, and our brains have specific regions to processing faces. You've perhaps seen a series of dots uh, back before emojis where you had those little emoticons, just a, a, a colon and a, a parenthesis, and people are seeing a little smiley face, right? We are clearly adding things. So even though we know certain things are illusions, we cannot help but perceive reality, well, incorrectly. You're looking at it going, I know this is wrong. Well, our goals for this section are understanding what sensation and perception are and understanding the processes by which the senses work. And a big way we're going to do that is by talking about Fight Club, which I know, I know the first rule is don't talk about. This is a study of inattentional blindness. And this was going to be, as was done by uh, Simonson Shabriz, two of the main authors here, have been doing work on this for a very long time. It has some really cool stuff on inattentional blindness and change blindness, which aren't quite the same thing. So the question they asked is, would you notice a fight? If, if you were near a fight, would you notice the fight? And you're probably listening to this saying, of course I'd notice the fight. And so they thought it'd be interesting to test this. And they were inspired by this case. So this is uh, uh, Kenny Conley on the, on the left and Michael Cox on the right. And these two were caught up in this uh, major issue, um, real conflict in 1995. So there was a shooting at a restaurant in Boston. And both of these officers went to the scene. Uh, Michael Cox in plain clothes and Kenny Connolly, uh, I believe, was in, in uniform. They didn't interact. Uh, over the course of this, uh, Michael Cox was, while looking for a suspect, uh, basically assaulted by four white police officers in what was considered to be a racially motivated beating. Kenny Connolly, a white police officer, was chasing after a suspect. No interaction. But in Conley's report, he went by this area where Michael Cox was being beaten just down an alley. 
And because he didn't stop, because he didn't intervene, he was charged with, and, and, and he said he didn't see the fight. He was charged with perjury, uh, basically labeled a racist cop, and sentenced to 34 months in jail. The reason this is so interesting is Simons and Shabriz looked at this and said, huh, we do a lot of stuff on this in the laboratory. How does this translate to the real world? The jury had no problem looking at Michael, uh, Mike, uh, Kenny Conley and saying, racist, go to jail. You lied. So there's some really interesting moving parts here to try to try to unpackage. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this case. You're the jury and we're going to use this case to say, what are the limits to perception? Well, why aren't you supposed to drive like this? Plenty of research says that it's as dangerous as having a couple of drinks and getting on the road. Uh, you look away, you're distracted and accidents increase. You know, certainly the, the mild annoyances of sitting behind someone when a light changes and they don't go because they're paying attention to their phone compared to the life-threatening dangers where someone's swerving into your lane because they had to answer a text right there. Let's look at something else. This is called change blindness. So it's not quite the same thing as inattentional blindness. And so I want you to look at this image and then I'm going to show you a mask. This is the mask. Okay. So here's our image. Here's the mask and here's the image, but it's not the same image. Something changed. And I want you to tell me what's changing between here and here, here and here. What's changing? We put the mask there and it's very difficult to tell. It's very difficult to tell. But if you're watching the video, you can go back and forth, you can move it around, and I can just give you the images right next to each other without the mask, and it should jump out to you, the windows. So why is it so hard to notice something like this with the mask? Well, were you paying attention to that spot? If you were paying attention to that spot, you might have noticed the change. But odds are you weren't paying attention to that spot, and odds are you didn't notice the change. Change blindness experience, experiments have been fantastic. They've replaced a person with another person in the middle of the experiment, right? So someone might stop and ask you directions. Two people come carrying a large board down the sidewalk, separating the two of you, and someone's behind that board and switches places with the person you were talking to and continues the conversation. Most people don't notice. Someone at a counter ducks down and another person comes up to hand you a paper in the middle of a conversation. Most people don't notice. The invisible gorilla is this example. That's the one where the people, the black shirts and the white shirts are passing basketballs and you're supposed to only pay attention to this group of people and not this group of people. And a lot of people don't notice this person in a gorilla costume that walks in the middle, beats their chest and, and walks on. Uh, people have shown movies or an actor is switched and they don't notice. Well, change blindness is the failure to notice an obvious change. Inattentional blindness is the failure to notice an unexpected item. So it's not quite the same thing, right? So if there's something in front of you that's changed, like a person, that's a big change blindness. Inattentional blindness is there's something going on that you're not quite aware of. So in this case, with a fight, it's not change blindness. You're not looking at something changing, but there's something happening around you that you're not aware of. Consider driving. You look at your phone. Both change blindness and inattentional blindness could be involved. Looking away from a scene to look at your phone, you may not notice the change to the scene. Change blindness. If you hold up your phone so you can still pay attention to the road, you may not notice a pedestrian or a braking motorist because you have limited attention and may be unable to notice a major event. So we know that we don't notice most of the world around us, right? And so most this is fine because most information isn't relevant to us. It doesn't matter, you know, what's happening around there. We do know that cognitive resources are limited and we focus only on the most salient stimuli. So you think about all the things that you pass by in the world, all the cars when you're driving, all the people, how many of that information is really relevant to you, right? We're not really focused on those things. Uh, you're, you're paying attention to the road in front of you. There could be a, a clown convention marching down the other side, and most people wouldn't notice because you just don't want to crash into the cars in front of you. So the famous gorilla study um, 
what they found was that depending on what people focused on, it influenced whether they saw the gorilla. So we consider this the if you're paying attention to the black team, they're probably more likely to notice the gorilla because the gorilla costume was the same color as the black shirts. If you're paying attention to the white team, you're more likely to filter out anything that was black because that would be distracting. And so under different conditions, people would be more or less likely to notice the gorilla. But we definitely see that a lot of people, especially in that condition, are not seeing this basically what they call the invisible gorilla. Well, this tells us very clearly that without attention, there is no perception. We see things if we're looking for them. Think about somebody in a classroom on a cell phone. You know, I've, I've used this example before because I've absolutely had this student in class where they're on their phone the entire time. They're, they're never paying attention. Um, they're never engaged. And at the end of the semester, they're like, why? Why am I getting, you know, a, a, a failing grade? And it's like, they're like, I've been here the whole time. And it's like, we've talked about this like 18 times. I, I don't know what, what to tell you at this point. Um, if we're, in, if we're there, if we're on that, that electronic, we're not, we're not there, right? We, we have a limited pool of attention. So noticing change depends on the similarity of the object to other objects and the difficulty of what we call the primary monitoring task. So with the gorilla, the hard task is not only do they have to measure, count how many passes, they have to count the difference between two different types of passes. So how many throw passes and how many bounce passes. So these two require two different numbers in the head and make the task harder. So now let's go back and look at again our fight club example, right? Um, they staged a fight in a well-lit public area to get an idea of what was happening with Kenny Conley and Michael Cox. Is it possible that Kenny Conley wasn't a racist bastard and in fact was uh, doing his job? Well, people say, well, you're a police officer. You should notice these things. We'll go through and we'll take a look. All right. <clears throat> Questions for you. Failure to notice an unexpected item. Is this change blindness or inattentional blindness? And the answer is, this is inattentional blindness. Change blindness recalls an obvious change. In the gorilla video, people were more likely to notice the gorilla when they paid attention to which team, the white or the black? And the answer was the black team. Remember, salience, things that matter. If there's something you know that you're filtering out because it's not relevant, you're less likely to, to, to notice it. That's why the white team members didn't notice, um, or the people paying attention to the white team didn't notice as well as likely. So uh, uh, the, the researchers define intentional blindness as the failure to see visible and otherwise salient events when one is paying attention to something else. And it was directly inspired by this trial. Right, they were at Harvard. This took place in Boston. And is it possible that Conley could have run right past the beating and not seen it? Well, do people sometimes not notice things? Think about uh, bicycles and bicycling. Right, a bicycle on the sidewalk or on the wrong side of the road is really dangerous. Think about what you're looking for on a sidewalk. You're looking for pedestrians, right? Uh, think about what you're looking for on the road. You're looking for vehicles coming, you know, in the direction you expect coming. You know, if you're pulling out, okay, the vehicles closest to you are going to be coming from your left and the further away ones from your right. What if someone's coming close to you on your, you know, on your right at a high rate of speed? It's an unexpected item. You're not looking for it. You're going to pull out. You're looking this way right? You're not looking this way. You're not paying as much attention there, except right there to pedestrians. So a fast vehicle coming the wrong way is dangerous. Now you're the motorist. Yes, you're supposed to pay attention to these things, but we look at why is it particularly dangerous to, to do certain things? You know, a bicycle, a car backing out of a, of a driveway <clears throat> sees, you know, pedestrians in that area on the sidewalk, but a bicycle is coming very fast. It's unexpected. So we're not expecting things. Another concept here is called generalizability. There's another word I'm going to give you called validity, and this is related to what's called external validity. 
a, an experiment is valid if it does what they said they were going to do. Okay. So if I say, I want to see, I want to create a scenario to see is it possible that Kenny Conley was telling the truth, right? We're not going to know anything for certain, but we're going to say this jury was sure that he was lying. But let's take a look. Now, a lot of studies are done with computer displays. Would this work in the real world? Generalizability is, is what we're doing here in this experiment relevant to what's out there. Polling data is the same way. Okay, if I did this poll, does this actually match what people, uh, what choices people are making? Consider taking a test. Does your performance represent your knowledge? <clears throat> Consider an experiment. Does the effect observed in a laboratory represent what would happen in the real world? That's what we're talking about. So uh, they referenced this older study, a slightly older study, where they had a, a clown on a unicycle. This is a picture from their study. <clears throat> and they asked people, did you see the clown? Well, the first thing, so they had this clown in the college quad on, on the unicycle. So basically, you know, dressed like this. And then as people exited the quad, they said, did you, did you notice anything uh, today? You know, out of the ordinary. And if people said no, if they said yes and said, yeah, I saw the clown, they got credit. Yeah, you saw it. If they said no, then they asked them, did you see the clown? So then they got kind of prompted. Uh, now, a clown's not a dangerous situation or a threat unless you're scared of clowns. So it's possible people are more sensitive to threatening or dangerous situations. But what we see is someone walking by themselves, not on a cell phone, when prompted, half of the time noticed. That's it. Just half of the time saw the clown. Um, people on their cell phones, that dropped with the general question to less than 10%. So <clears throat> the study had a, uh, a couple of conditions. And the first thing it did is they had volunteers run after an experimenter uh, at night on a well-lit path. They had to stay back about 30 feet and they had to count the number of times the experimenter patted their head. They patted their head, they, you know, each hand. They, so the experimenter is jogging, the person behind them is jogging, because they're trying to mimic, you know, the experience of, of chasing a suspect um, and, you know, having a fight. And then they would tap their head with their hands for a total of nine times. And they, so people, when they were done, they're going to be asked, did you see the fight? And how many times did they touch their head with their hands? So these were pictures from the study. <clears throat> this was the, the direction they took here, right, on this uh, image, the first image. The second image has the people who were... Uh, having the fight. So two people pretended to uh, beat up a third person. The fight was eight meters off the path. This is about the same distance between the path and the person they were chasing. And it was about a quarter, a little over a quarter of the way into the route, right? 400 meters is about once around a, a track. Okay, so it's not um, like, a, like a racetrack running for, for, for track running you know, events. So it's not very far. Okay, so this wasn't extremely long. Um, so they were loud, they were making noise, they were, they were trying to draw attention, right? They were doing the normal things you would do in a fight. So after they were finished running, they said, how many hand touches did you count, right? How many pats on the head? And did you see anything unusual? If they said yes, they saw the fight, they got credit. If they said no, they were then said, did you see anyone fighting? If they were prompted and got it, they had to give details about the fight. Right. So they couldn't just say, yeah, they had to say, oh, yeah, one person was wearing this, this. They had, to, they had to give some more information. So this is a way of getting at, did they see the fight? So what we see here is that only seven out of 20 reported seeing the fight. So that's terrible, right? Like in, on, under these conditions, only 35 percent of the people saw this saw this fight and all they were doing was, was jogging after somebody in a fairly short experience so, so they did it again they said what's the effect of darkness and they had to have another control condition or control group right so they wanted to compare this to because again this is just a uh, without a comparison it's not really an experiment it's more of like a demonstration it's like oh look people didn't notice so an experiment has to have things to compare and say okay do they notice more at night or during the day? Do you think they were more likely to notice during the day? Well, I mean, I would. It's, it's brighter. It's easier to see. And yes, uh, during the day, uh, over half of the people saw the fight. And then we asked the, uh, one more question. 
right? So we want to get out what they were looking at. And that's, okay, these head pats. What was with the six and the three? Well, the answer is cognitive load. Cognitive load is how many things can we pay attention to at one time? And so in this case, the effect of cognitive load related to, you know, how much can they pay attention to? Uh, and so here we see uh, study three, they had some volunteers keep track of how many times the experimenter patted their head with each hand, and the other group didn't have to pay attention to anything. So do you think that the people who had to pay attention to the, the cognitive load more, uh, do you think they had more trouble or do you think they, they found it easier? Well, <clears throat> here was the, uh, the final results. We see that the, um, the people who only had to pay attention to the, uh, to the runner were very likely to see the fight, 72%. Those that had to keep the two counts were almost as, as bad as the night condition. 42% of them noticed the fight. So as we're looking at this, we're saying, okay, um, this is not good, right? For, for this group, um, you know, it was, it was 18 out of 25. For this group, it was 14 out of 33. And this was the interesting group too, this comparison here, because you're saying, all right, if you have to pay attention to this, these cognitive load issues, how hard is that? And the answer is, it's really hard the more you're having to keep in your head. So they also found this with the gorilla study, right? Um, and this is an image from that study. What they found was that the people who saw the gorilla were more likely to make counting errors. And the same thing happened in the fight study. Those that had to keep the two counts were more likely to make errors if they saw the fight. Distraction. More things to keep track of. And it's difficult. So we want to take this and say, all right, what does this tell us about experiments? I mentioned you got to have something to compare. You got to have some kind of manipulation. If we just said, okay, let's see if they see the fight, not really an experiment. The manipulation means a treatment is administered to one or more groups. This is the classical design. There's, there's other types of designs. But in this study, what were we comparing? What was the difference between the groups? That we were looking at. Well, one group, um, th there were two what we call independent variables, all right? And the classical design looks like this. You have an experimental group and a control group, or you have an experimental group one and a different experimental group. And the DV, the dependent variable, is whatever the outcome is that you measure. So you're controlling something, right? Either comparing groups or comparing conditions and you're measuring the outcome. So for here, what was the manipulation? There were, there were two manipulations in their study, in the, the Fight Club study. One manipulation was cognitive load. How many times, right, were they patting their head with each hand compared to not having to pay attention? The other manipulation was darkness. What was the effect of darkness? Now, it's really a quite simple study. All you're saying is, did you notice the fight? A lot of studies will have, you know, other types of measures. What was the measure? What was the dependent variable here? Well, as noted, it was very simple. It was just, did you notice the fight? Well, validity, as mentioned earlier, with what we call external validity, uh, is something's valid, it's reasonable, accurate, and justifiable. And so, is this a valid study? Did Kenny Conley face similar circumstances to what was seen in the Shabri et al. study? In order to generalize the results, we have to show validity. So there's a number of types of validity, but let's focus on three. And let's start with construct validity. Construct validity is um, basically, are we measuring what we say we're measuring, right? Uh, so are they measuring the likelihood of seeing a fight? Are they measuring something similar to what Kenny Connolly experienced? Constructs can be anything and they want, they're related to, are we, you know, uh, what are we measuring? We can measure memory and creativity and anger. We can measure, did someone see a fight? And we also have to establish what's called reliability. Well, reliability means 
If we did the same test again, would we get the same results? An intelligence test better have reliability, which means you better score the same on that intelligence test if you take it today, if you take it next week, right? Otherwise, it's not a measure of intelligence, it's a measure of something else. I mean, there are certain tests that you might have different experiences day to day. You could have tests that are related to mood. Sure, your mood shouldn't be the same all the time. So what we're looking at is the combination, uh, the, the, the connection between reliability and validity. <clears throat> and we see in the last image here, we're hitting the bullseye, right? If we are measuring something repeatedly and getting the same results, it's reliable. If we're measuring what we say we're measuring, then it's valid. So hitting that bullseye means we're, we're measuring what we say we're measuring. Well, then you have what's called internal validity. This is also known as what's called the third variable rule. So were the researchers able to rule out other possible explanations? For instance, did the volunteers somehow find out there was a there was a study and knew there was a fight? Were the fighters too quiet? If nobody saw the fight, not a good study, right? Because then the fighters are too quiet. It's not visible. If I ran five miles away from the fight and said, oh, nobody saw the fight. It's, it's impossible to see the fight. Yeah, because the study was stupid, right? Because of course, you're not going to see the fight if they're five miles away. So we want to see if these things are, they make sense, right? So you, you need to see that people are missing it. People are getting it. And then external validity was what I mentioned. Does the simulated fight, right, match what happened in Connolly situation? Do the students face a similar situation? Can the study be generalized? Well, let's think about that experience, right? Um, did the students face a similar situation to what Kenny Connolly experienced? Which situation would be most similar? High cognitive load? or low cognitive load? Well, what is the police officer paying attention to? There was just a shooting. The police officer is chasing after a suspect. And what's he probably paying attention to? He's just jogging along. Oh, I wonder what's going on over there. Or is he focused in on maybe the person's hands, maybe what they're wearing to get a description? If they get away, you need to be able to give a description. And if there was just a shooting, you better be paying attention to see if that person pulls a gun. So I'm thinking that the night condition more than the day condition and the high cognitive load condition more than the load cognitive load condition, which means I would expect the person to not see a fight happening down an alley while they're focused on chasing a suspect. And that's the key, right? So. Can I prove that Kenny Conley wasn't racist? No, but the jury sure saw, thought that he was lying and the racial components certainly fed into that. Now, are there racist cops? Yeah, the four guys were beating up Michael Cox were, were the worst, right? Um, but they couldn't catch any of them. And that meant that, you know, people wanted to see justice. And I don't know that this was necessarily justice, but um, it certainly wasn't for, for Kenny Conley uh, in this case, because again, the idea of reasonable doubt. An uninformed jury might say, yeah, we're pretty sure you're lying. But as a, as a psychologist, as, as somebody who understands inattentional blindness, are you sure? Are you comfortable sending someone to prison you know what I mean? In a case where we know how human perception is. Now, let me get you a couple questions before we go to the results. Third variable rule. What type of validity is this? This is internal validity. Is there another explanation for what we're seeing? This is required for generalizability. This would be external validity. And Reliability is a part of construct validity. I know this is a complex topic, and I know that it might be tough to remember these things. But remember in psychology, everything we really know is experimental. We learned it somehow going through 
data collection and, and experimental design, which means this is really important. Now, let's look at the results. Conley was allowed to remain free on appeals. So three years after the incident, two other officers were convicted of Cox's beating. And this was horrific, okay? The guy was in the hospital. Um, he was getting threatened by other cops, you know, who were calling him like a traitor for like wanting justice for getting beaten and put in the hospital, like really awful stuff. Um, Cox was eventually awarded 900000 by the state. Connolly, 10 years later, was exonerated and awarded uh, basically his back pay. So it came out to a bunch of money all at once, but I mean, it sucked for him at the time. And he's been mostly, I believe, um, kind of reintegrated, rehabilitated uh, in terms of people accepting that this is possible. But most people still have a hard time believing that if you're near a fight, you might not have seen it. Most people still believe for a long time that he was a lying racist bastard. Um, as psychologists, we know we have limited perception. And if you don't see it, it doesn't exist to you. In this case, we can't really confidently say he was lying, right? We can say, well, he should have been paying better attention, but also given cognitive load and, you know, the, the very real threat of, of violence, it's hard to even do that. But we can see how things can get worked up. Now, this introduction hopefully gets us into the idea of how perception works. We are not perceiving, you know, like we're not walking through the world with a camera. You know what I mean? We are walking through the world with our own expectations and influences. So sensation is a process of receiving information from the world. A sensory receptor is stimulated. Right now, your sensory receptors all over your body uh, have been stimulated by what you're wearing. And yet you've tuned most of it out. You've habituated to it and you're not sensitive to it. Uh, there's all this visual information happening, most of which you're not paying attention to. Perception involves organizing, interpreting, and experiencing. So you can sense, but not perceive. And I would say that most things likely fall into that category. Sense organs operate through what we call sensory receptor cells. We also consider that we have <clears throat> two types of processing, top-down and bottom-up. We go through the world with a lot of top-down processing, which is we know things we've already acquired and our, ex we, these, our expectations are very heavily driven by our processing. So we expect to see certain things. We're going to see those things. The bottom-up processing is guided by the environment, right? It's a completely new situation where you have to process everything fresh. Well, consider we have... Uh, receptors, right, for our main senses that translate information from the environment um, and that's interpreted in the brain. We've got visual energy, uh, light, you know, which is light, hearing, which is vibration of air, touch, which is pressure, pain, temperature, and taste and smell, which are chemical. You recall from earlier, um, you know, when we kind of introduced, you know, do we perceive reality that we don't? Uh, we don't see a lot. We hear, smell. We're simply not capable of perceiving a large number of things. Consider, um, you know, all the things that we don't and how we put things together. Um, here we have photoreceptors for vision, mechanoreceptors for hearing and touch, and chemoreceptors for taste and smell. We know that we've got a bunch of senses and the number that we get to depends on how we're counting them, right? So it can depend on a lot of things. And we are only aware if we have the sensory cells that can detect them. There's other things that we have. We can sense pressure, for instance, in our, our tracking our blood pressure so that our you know, bodies can adapt. Um, but we can't perceive infrared so here's an example of infrared vision, where you see here, um, you know, an animal at night. But this isn't what infrared looks like. Infrared doesn't look like anything we can perceive. Infrared vision is basically using like a heat 
heat sensor and then you see it right in terms of like these heat maps but that's not what it is that's just how it's translated we're taking a sense we don't have and trying to translate it into a sense we do have um so some of these creatures can perceive this we've got uh, a certain fish that can perceive electrical fields you know and use them to hunt some birds and butterflies can see light at frequencies we can't perceive what we call ultraviolet these are basically colors past violet on the rainbow so like that you know ultra like superviolet um and they see things <clears throat> differently right and so we're looking at what these look like under different conditions and so they're getting this different kind of experience right so here we have for instance on the left regular and then ultraviolet filter and then on the right would be um, uh, infrared so what these things look like to different kind of receptors now here's what our photoreceptors look like this is on the bottom we see the actual layers of the retina this is in the very back of the eye the very back they are very thin uh, almost you know invisible to the naked eye um, <clears throat> with these layers of cells I mean they're layers of cells they're very small uh, and these are effectively neurons so these sensory receptors are in many cases like modified or very similar to neurons and we have what are called photoreceptors and so this is a weird kind of configuration because here the top represents the back of the eye the bottom represents you know the the surf closest to the surface so light is passing through your ganglion cells then your bipolar cells then reaching your photoreceptors which are your rods and cones rods and cones are located in the back of the eye cones are clustered in the fovea um, the macula is a little bigger, bigger than that. We have the most of your photoreceptors. And then you've got rods and cones kind of spread out. But once you get outside of there, you see more rods. Well, rods are really good at, is there light? That's all they give you, basically black and white. Cones are really good at high detail color vision. At night, when there's very low light, what are we seeing? Well, if you've ever, um, you know, looked at like a dim star, Right. I'm assuming you have. I know that in you know Southern California, it's so much light pollution. We we never see uh, that many. But let's you know you think about a dim star and you look up at the sky at this very dim star, and when you look at it, it disappears. It disappears because it's hitting your your fovea. The light is hitting your fovea, and your fovea needs a lot of light to function. It's a lot of cones, the color stuff. They need a lot of light. So you look slightly to the side, and it's back because now you're detecting it with your periphery uh, of, of that, which has a lot more rods that are much better at detecting dim light. We also have what's called a blind spot, right? And you see this, you see here uh, in this image is optic nerve. Well, the optic nerve is where your blind spot is because the light is coming through here, right? You're detecting it on your fovea and different parts of your, you know, uh, receptors. But our eyes are, are oddly um, kind of uh, put together where the light has to pass through all these layers. And so you've got to do a lot of post-processing on it. And then all the blood vessels and the, um, the, the axons, you know, basically the optic nerve has to exit through this, which means you've got a big chunk here, uh, about a one and a half millimeters wide, where there's no... Um, no photoreceptors because you've got to have these things exit so we see a number of things happening here at the level of rods and cones the level of cones right we've got these kind of pairs of colors like red green blue yellow and black white where we're kind of measuring how much of these kind of opponent colors there are and we've also got the blind spot and you can use this little schematic here to, to, to test it if you were to say since this is on the left focus on this with your left eye the little cross in the middle and then kind of move closer and away from the screen until this disappears this can get into your blind spot and disappear and it's not there we don't notice our blind spot under normal circumstances because our eyes are constantly moving around jittering now we have generally 
uh, three types of cones, right? Red, green, and yellow, uh, and blue. Red, green, and blue is what we're sensitive to, RGB. And some people are colorblind. But colorblind is actually an interesting myth. Colorblind doesn't mean you see in black and white. Colorblind means you see with one, generally, it's, black and white is extremely rare. It's possible. But most colorblind people see in shades of uh, two cones. So what does that look like? Well, I can show you dog vision. Dogs are traditionally described as colorblind, but they're not. They just have two photoreceptors. So their rainbow looks like this blue to yellow with different shades. Humans have a third photoreceptor and we get our rainbow that we're familiar with. But what is a butterfly? Um, I can't even show you what a butterfly rainbow looks like that have five photoreceptors. I can't imagine colors that don't exist for me. The mantis shrimp has 16 different types of photoreceptors. I mean, the, the rainbow for these things must be fantastic. So, um, we have these kind of, you know, myths about colorblindness, but we're just used to having three cones. And so someone missing one will have a different type of rainbow. Maybe not this exactly, but this is one common type. Color vision stretches through this part of the electromagnetic spectrum, giving us another example of what we don't sense, right? Because look, here's nanometers in terms of wavelength. And wavelength is something that we'll talk about, you know, in other other factors too. But basically, here's your here's your wave, right? Like you think of like a sine wave, and the distance between this the two peaks is right. You got peak, peak. The distance between those two peaks is what we call the wavelength, the length of the wave. Well, red has a much larger distance between the two peaks than blue, and that's how we're getting color. Like that's what color is made of, of the distance between these peaks at this certain frequency of what we consider to be visible light. And that's it. You know, other past here, we're not seeing it, but this would be ultraviolet down here and infrared up here. Here's another example of what it looks like to be colorblind. So this image here is what a typical person would see this so this is like the stimulus and these three images are what people would perceive with different types of colorblindness now they can still see the two in these two types but in this one they can't so the idea here is just that colorblindness is going to affect you know the distinction between what appear to be very different colors well these cones have different what we call peaks right in terms of what we're perceiving in terms of what they're sensitive to. And so each cone is sensitive, might, might have a, a you know, tuning that looks like this. And if you're on either side of this, right, if you're at this frequency here, you could be either one of these colors. But because you've got these other cones, they're able to kind of, you know, tell you, no, you're on this side of it or you're on this side of it. So you're missing a cone. And all of a sudden, you can't tell which side of this you're on. You can't really tell which color, which would mean that these two colors would effectively look exactly the same to you. Um, we've got what's called sensory threshold. We can sense a certain amount of energy, and anything below that level is not perceived. Consider that your rods are more sensitive than your cones. Rods can be activated by a single Photon. They can do this experience experiment. They'll, they'll, they'll fire a single photon at your eye and be like, what did you see? And it's like, it's like, I didn't even see anything, but like, I, I have this feeling that I, that there was light, right? Like I, I feel like there was light. It's just such a very sensitive, sensitive thing. Cones require more energy. And that's why that star that we look at in the dim sky disappears. Low light is black and white. At night, you get up at the middle of the night to go get a drink of water and you're wandering through your home, you know what color things are, but you're not perceiving color. That low light, when it's really dim, just enough to, to, to see, is black and white. Different types of threshold, absolute and difference. The absolute threshold is the smallest magnitude of a stimuli that can be detected. The difference threshold is the smallest difference you can detect. So think of like a hearing test, right? 
and um, and they're saying, okay, do you hear this or not? And they're playing these really kind of faint sounds. Your threshold is when you detect it half the time, right? If it was too quiet to be perceived, you wouldn't detect it at all any more than half the time, and you know it's it's easier to detect. Well, think about change. If music is is you know you're listening to loud music and they turn it up just a little bit, we don't notice the change. When you go to concerts and you're listening to live music, they will generally you know often I should say increase the volume over the course of the night because you adapt. It starts out loud and then you adapt to it, and then they have to make it louder. And by the end of the night, your ears are ringing when you walk out, and you're getting these after effects, and you probably caused you know hearing damage. Um, and that's the idea. What we see um, in uh, something called psychophysics. This is an area of, of research where we're absolutely looking at, um, you know, these uh, these um, uh, changes in stimuli. So the idea becomes: How much change are we perceiving? Well. Uh, we're able to detect small changes in weak stimuli, but only large challenges in strong stimuli. And so what you do is, like we said with the, with the dark, um, I should say with the, with the dark and light, with the sounds, can we um, perceive these differences, right? What does it take to actually do this? A branch of psychology is purely focused on perception, right? Sensation and perception. Are you detecting change? What are we capable of detecting? Quite interesting. And this is why we don't notice that, you know, you, how, how your clothes feel. This is why we don't notice things, you know, that kind of fade in the periphery. If a receptor is repeatedly stimulated, it becomes fatigued. Think about impossible colors. Think about eating a bowl of, of uh, salty potato chips. It starts out salty and then by the end, nothing, right? It doesn't taste salty. We've adapted. Our senses have adapted. And we get to what's called impossible colors. I can show you a green that you've never seen before. Not this one. You've seen this green. We're looking at it now. But if you were to cover one eye and then get so close to the screen, make this so big on your screen that all you see is red with this eye. Okay. And I just look at the red here. And then I look at this for about 30 seconds. And then I uncover and I go back and forth and I look just at the green. Well, this eye has been staring at red. So I have fatigued the red cones. Now when I look at the green, I'm getting only the response from the green cones, which means I'm going to be seeing a color that doesn't exist. They can only exist after I've fatigued the red cones. Okay, so because under normal circumstances, I'm looking at something green, but I'm also getting feedback from red. But once I overpower those red, they get tired. They adapt. And then I look at the green, and it's this pure, pure, pure green. So I mentioned these pairs before, red, green, blue, yellow, and black, white. The reason that the impossible color thing works is because of the red, green continuum. Basically, we're seeing just these colors, right? So red and green have this kind of opponent um, experience where we're getting this, this, uh, this interference. We also look at the adaptation, right? Dark and light. We have increased sensitivity to light after being in a dark room and decreased sensitivity after being in a bright room. You go into a dark um, um, store, you know, you're at the beach and it's super bright out and you walk into a, a store that has normal lighting. The person working there can see fine, but because you've been in that bright, bright sun, it's difficult to see, you've decreased sensitivity. And then you adapt, you know, it takes a while. Say you're in there for 20 minutes, you walk back outside and it's like, you know, a, a vampire and, and you're about to burst into flames. It's so very bright. It takes a while to adapt. All right, questions. Cones are most effective in what light and perceive what? Is it bright black and white, dark black and white, bright color or dark color? And the answer is bright and color. They're most effective in bright light and perceive color. Top-down processing is guided by what? The world you observe, knowledge you have about the world, the visual system, and the way the eye processes light. Which one is it? It is knowledge you have about the world. 
And, you know, this is one of those things where, uh, you know, I remember learning about this in psychology and just being fascinated by what do you mean my, my knowledge about the world is influencing how I'm, I'm processing things around me? You know, we come into psychology thinking we're going to be talking about, you know, disorders and we start and we end up talking about how your perception works. And it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, there's a, a couple of main theories when it comes to vision. Trichromatic theory and uh, opponent process theory. Well, trichromatic theory is based on the idea there's three kinds of cones, red, green, and blue. Uh, it doesn't explain after images, but it does a really good job of explaining how color is mixed together. Opponent process theory is really good at explaining these after images, right? It doesn't necessarily explain how colors mix as well, but it does explain the processing mechanisms in the after images. So depending on what we're looking at, these can be good. And then you get even to more because you think about things like why our colors appear the same under different lighting conditions. And we've got some really deep, deep brain processing doing those things. Um, and our last note about vision is this. <clears throat> we've got uh, these fields, right? Well, everything over here is processed back here and everything over here is processed here even though both eyes are seeing what's here right if i if i look straight ahead and i put my hand here and i close this eye, i can still see a bunch of a bunch of my hand which means both eyes are getting both fields so you see this image here they're crossing the information and sending all the information from each field to the opposite side of the brain this is how we're dealing with our visual fields and where they're being processed in the brain. And our occipital lobe is pretty much dedicated to, the, to this kind of information. All right. Which of our color vision theories uh, is concerned with the idea that there's three kinds of cones in the retina that respond primarily to light in either the red, green, or blue range of wavelengths? Is it opponent process, psychophysical, trichromatic, or sensory adaptation? And the answer is trichromatic. Now we get into auditory perception and we get into the link between vision and hearing and language. So this is a concept called the McGurk effect, which means our, uh, what we um, see visually will influence what we hear. That should make sense to a certain extent when you are in a very loud environment and someone's talking to you, you're probably looking at their mouth to get this information. What happens when we have this interference? They will play a sound, they'll basically play uh, like the, a syllable over and over like ba, ba, and they'll have people, they'll play that sound, but they'll have people make two different mouth shapes while they're playing that sound. They'll either go like ba or like fa. When they make the mouth shape that lines up with the sound, right, but they're playing ba, the fa mouth shape, people will say they heard fa. You can find these examples, and it's worth looking if you can find some McGurk, some nice McGurk examples here. But what's cool about this is it tells us that, one, uh, our, our expectations are driving our perception. And even more interesting, I'll tell you this, You've got to put pause. You've got to hold the auditory information, match it up with the visual information, and then change your perception, which is just wild. Well, our auditory process is works on mechanoreceptors, similar to what the skin, right, or our skin senses do. These are sound waves, pressure, that kind of energy. And just like hairs in the skin, uh, we have cilia in our cochlea. So we're going to look at the organization of the auditory system, the perceptual systems, and then what's happening in the temporal lobe. So here's our inner ear. Um, basically, you've got here's your you know external ear, uh, middle ear, and then inner ear. And the middle ear uh, has these these components, uh, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And the inner ear is our cochlea and all these. And the, the most important thing I want to focus on is right here. This is the cochlea and the cochlea is connected to the uh, cranial nerve that connects directly to um, the, the brain. 
So you'll notice this is embedded. This isn't in your brain. This is embedded in kind of like the skull, the sinuses here. Now, uh, we are sensitive to certain components, and we're going to use this to look at a few things. So um, here's our uh, malleus, incus, and stapes, which are hammer, anvil, and stirrups, right? That's what they're, you know, the English translation. And what you have is your ear canal. The sounds travel here, reach your tympanic membrane, right? Tympani is a type of drum. It's also called the ear drum, which then travels through these three bones to your oval window, which then passes through the fluid of your cochlea. And this little round window here on the other end is going to move. And this is basically vibrating very quickly with the sounds. Well, we're sensitive to sounds that are between 20, approximately, and 20,000 hertz. Um, younger people more sensitive than older people in this regard. So we tend to lose the top end here. This is pitch, right? How high or low frequency something sounds. And then you have what's called intensity, the density of air. This is loudness, basically how compacted are these, uh, is the air with the sound. We also have what's called timbre, timbre which are the characteristics of the sound. Is it one frequency or many? A pure sine wave is a single sound, but usually in a lot of, most sounds, it's a combination of things. Even musical instruments are a combination of many sounds. Um, so, and we like these things, they're these nice complex sounds. Here we have our auditory cortex in pink, and the other areas around it are related to sound processing or uh, language processing or production. And so this, the, this auditory cortex actually folds under here because you see this, this fissure, um, the separation here. So if you were to pull this back, there'd be more auditory cortex in there. The tonotopic map of the cochlea tells us that um, you have a lot more cochlea dedicated to the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies. If you were to unravel this, look at how much of this, how far we have to go to get to 4,000 hertz, then quite a bit to 5,000 hertz, then 7,000 hertz, and the rest of this little space here gets us from 7,000 to 20,000 hertz. That's why older people will tend to lose these. You can take these uh, really, what I find to be depressing sound um, uh, hearing tests where you basically they play these sounds and it's like hey if you can hear this you're this age or this you're this age or this you're this age and you lose the sounds uh, as you as you get older I had a huge loss um, my younger son would just he, he had the loudest voice you could possibly imagine I swear I lost like a 2000 hertz range you know in the course of like a month just from the the, the intensity of the of the sound um, but it's normal to lose that as we age. And some younger people do more damage too. If you're, if, if you got your windows up in your car and I can hear your music in my car with my windows up, that's really, really bad. Like you're doing a lot of damage to your hearing. Um, but we lose these sounds. The good news is voices tend to be here. So this, this area that, you know, in terms of communication and understanding people, we tend to keep a lot of that. Um, We've got this tonotopic map on the cochlea. We also have it in the um, in the brain. You'll notice here that your brain is actually dedicated to different frequencies. You know, more for the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies. But when you start to lose the higher frequencies, one of the cases of you know where you people will hear like those higher high pitched sounds like tinnitus could be related to the fact that your brain's not getting input anymore. And your brain's not just going to say, hey, we're not getting input. Let's just not do anything. It's going to use the brain cells for something else. It's going to use, so you're going to have possibly something else stimulating those sounds. Where are the higher frequencies processed in the auditory cortex? Dorsal, ventral, anterior, or posterior? I know there's like 15 concepts altogether here. The answer is posterior. The higher frequencies are in the back, right? They're further back in the temporal low. As you age, you first lose the ability to hear what? High, low, mid, or loud frequencies. And the answer is, we first lose our high frequencies. Well, related to our sense of hearing is our sense of balance. The body senses go beyond balance, but we start with this because these, here's our cochlea, this part down here, the snail part, but this stuff up here is, uh, is part of our 
balance. Basically, where is your body in space? As you tilt your head, you basically are moving these fluids, and that's sending a signal to your brain that says your head is tilted. Now, that's fine. You're like, I know my head is tilted. I tilted it. But if your eyes are closed, if you're moving, motion, it's really useful information because you're, you're constantly adapting. Uh, let's say you're walking up a hill or you stumble on a, on a sidewalk. Your, your body's adapting to, to help to catch you by monitoring where all these things are. So you've got your vestibular organ and you've got kinesthetic receptors in your muscles, joints, and skin, which are telling your body where it is. You're telling your brain where your body is in space. So these things in your um, vestibular organ, your saccule, uh, your utricle, and your semicircular canals are these fluid-filled things that are basically telling your, your brain where your head is and, you know, by relation where your body is tilted in space. So you can kind of put these things together. So that's the part for kind of the balance in head. And you've also got your kinesthetic receptors, which is another sense that we don't even think about which is where's your body in space? And I know we don't think about it, but we think about how important it is. There have been cases of people, it's rare, it's extremely rare, um, but that will actually lose their kinesthetic receptors through some kind of infection that just attacks only these. They find it very difficult to move. There was a BBC documentary called The Man Who Lost His Body about this guy named Ian who was able to adapt to this, but it was a lot of work. It took a long time to adapt because without kinesthetic receptors, you have no control over your body. There's no feedback. So you have to constantly be sending your body signals and know where it is in space. Where is it, right? Well, we take these for granted. So his situation was to use visual information. So he had to constantly look at his body, but by looking at his body and where his body was in space, he could move, right? And he eventually got really good at this um, in order to, you know, otherwise he would have been stuck in a wheelchair or, or worse, you know, without any ability to, uh, to move through space, right? With even a more, a more diminished ability to, to function. So you have to figure out all these ways you can do this. Well, our skin senses, now we think about touch. We've got four types of receptors, but we've got three main types of sensory information, which means our receptors are, are sharing information right and so in terms of the types of receptors i'm not as interested as i am in the types of information they can give us pressure sensitivity right basically like pushing down temperature and pain pain is controlled by what we call free nerve endings basically you just got these nerves and so let's say you burn yourself or cut yourself you've sliced through a nerve ending and it's sending a signal that says this this is not good spinal cord to your thalamus to your somatosensory cortex right in your parietal lobe which is the physical response and the limbic system which is the emotional response right pain is not just the physical sensation it's also the you know emotion the panic the the feelings that go with that we can do interesting things with pain um pain is the experience is mostly emotional and we can often distract ourselves by focusing on other things we have what are called pain gates in the brainstem, and we can regulate them by kind of overwhelming these. So um, they use uh, these heat patches, right? If you have like an injury, you put a heat patch. I'm thinking, how does this help it? Is it relaxing it? Sure, maybe, but what it's doing is it's overwhelming your nerves with a heat signal. So let's say you got a pinched, like a pinched you know, nerve or muscle or something. It's all really painful. It's a tiny area. It hurts a lot, but it's a tiny area. A pain uh, a heat patch is taking a lot, is covering a lot more area. So you've got a lot of signal that says warm and a really small signal that says ow. So most of what the signal you're getting, the, the ow is getting overwhelmed by the warm, which is why these patches work. It's not just relaxing you, it's actually overwhelming the signal. And by overwhelming, it allows it to, to kind of, you know, calm. Um, you can also diminish it by looking at the injured area. Usually the imagination of pain is worse than the pain or, or the injury. Sweet smells and tastes, candies, can, can make us feel better. Um, I mentioned the heat patches and the drugs. And, you know, some people will say acupuncture, maybe. Um, but when it comes to the drugs, uh, there's 
one over-the-counter medication that, uh, in fact, a lot of over-the-counter medications work better than narcotics for pain, but they're more toxic. You can't take them as long. But there's one, uh, Tylenol, that not just works on the emotional, but also work, uh, not just works on the physical, but works on the emotional. It can actually diminish the emotional experience of pain. Well, what happens when you have pain without a cause? And an example here is phantom limb. Well, what we have here is uh, what um, uh, uh, Ramachandran designed. Uh, he's a professor, a uh, very, very well-known uh, professor at the University of San Diego, uh, California, uh, University of California, San Diego. Um, and he designed this mirror box where someone who is missing a limb, okay, may have a lot of pain. And the reason is you're getting this, this kind of clench signal in a lot of cases, but there's nothing to say, hey, you've overclenched, right? There's no feedback. So you get visual feedback because you put both limbs into the mirror box. One of them might be missing, but the missing one now appears to be there because that mirror is making it look like it's there, okay? Now, you then clench both hands, even the one that doesn't exist, and relax them, and it causes this, this relaxation. And so it's this really, again, the visual system in humans is, is so potent that it can overwhelm the, you know, uh, these other, these other systems. And then we have, um, you know, our last main type is our chemoreceptors, our last type of, of, uh, of sensors. So you've got, these are the chemicals that are present in the air and food that we're sensitive to. And here is your, um, epithelium in your uh, sinuses, right? Your olfactory epithelium, which is connected directly to your olfactory bulb, which is connected really, really directly to your, um, to your limbic system. It's like a direct line, almost to like your emotional centers. Um, and learning happens very quickly. Scent can, can give very powerful memories because of this, this direct connection. Um, we call our taste buds. Weird myths about taste. I've seen these maps of the tongue that are like sours here, bitters here. No, who, who came up with that? That's insane. Um, these things are spread out. All, all your different types of taste buds are all spread out. And you're sensitive to thousands of chemicals. Interestingly, your taste isn't as sensitive as smell. You have five classes of receptors. Um, this last one is more recent, but sweet, sour, salty, and bitter have been known for a long time. The last one, fats, is umami. Uh, and this has been accepted as a type of receptor. But in addition, the tongue is sensitive to touch, temperature, and pain. So, you know, foods aren't just the flavors, they're also the rest of it, the rest of the experience too. You might particularly like a food texture or dislike it. Uh, you might find it to be, you know, the temperature needs to be a certain way. And people who like spicy foods, well, I'm not saying they're into pain, but they're kind of into pain, at least at least in that way. Um, spicy foods are capsaicin, which send a, a pain signal. Uh, smell is much more sensitive than taste. And you've got your receptors here, particularly sensitive to what we call organic compounds, right? We also are sensitive to chemicals, but that's a different, a different thing. That's actually not quite the same as our sense of smell. It's a different detection. There's also something called pheromones. Now we kind of have this. Now you notice here's the brain of a snake. This is the organ that does pheromones, right? And this is the, the rest of the part that does scent. So a snake, a reptile in general, is going to have a huge component of its, you know, basically brain processing dedicated to smell. And a lot of that's related to pheromones. Pheromones are the sense um, of, well, basically, they can cause us to have an experience without our being aware of it, right? So you ever have this where somebody's like extra attractive, right? All of a sudden, you know, and, and it's not because it's a, a, you know, a teen movie where the girl takes off her glasses and all of a sudden it's magical. Um, so someone could be secreting pheromones. For instance, um, it's believed very strongly that women who live together, their, their menstrual cycles will synchronize because of pheromones. And we may be 
secreting these and we're unaware of how we're affected. Uh, and there's some studies that suggest there's some really weird things happening with these things where we can actually see behavioral changes in people without their awareness um, because we're not like smelling anything out of the ordinary, but we do have this. So humans have a very diminished um, femoronasal organ. It's also called Jacobson's organ, a very diminished, you know, one, but we are still sensitive to certain pheromones. And again, this should be terrifying because it's scents that we secrete that affect us that we're not really aware of. Okay, which is a type of taste bud receptor? Temperature, texture, bitterness, or pain? The answer is bitterness. The others can be related to our enjoyment of food, but they're not a type of receptor. The saccule and utricle send information to the brain about the sensation of pain, body orientation, pheromones, or saltiness and sweetness? And the answer is body orientation. That's it for our sensation and perception. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I look forward to our future discussions. Thank you.